If you have wondered about how holograms work, you've come to the right place. I will explain how they work so you can intuitively understand them, and I will explain how holograms might even be one of the mechanisms for memory in the brain. I will show you what a hologram is, explain waves of light, and most importantly, the concepts of interference and diffraction, which are crucial to understanding why holograms work. Well, if I go too fast uh, at some point, just stop, think, and then replay that part. That'll help. This is a hologram, just a piece of glass that has photographic film emulsion on it. And when I look at it, through it, it just looks like it's cloudy. It has been exposed by a scene using a, a laser light. And what's recorded on here is an interference pattern. And I'll show you what all this means a little bit later. When I put the hologram in a particular position relative to the laser light source, I can now see the scene that has been captured on it. The laser light source is not like a normal laser pointer, which makes a small dot. Instead, it is a laser that casts a wider beam of light. You can see a couple of dice around lens being held by a clip and a little toy lizard. If you were to move your head to the right, you could see uh, more of the die in the back, and the lens would be covering more of that die. It is different than a two-dimensional photo in that it actually reproduces the original light waves as if they were coming from the original objects that were photographed. The set of light waves that come from the objects of any scene is called the wave front. In a two-dimensional photo, all of the light waves originate from points on the flat picture so that you don't see 3D and your eyes only need to focus at one distance. But a hologram recreates the light wave front as if it were coming from the original object's photograph. This lets you see the 3D view of the original scene as if you were looking through a window. In this hologram, when I move the camera around, the perspective changes and you can see behind the holographic objects. The camera has a hard time keeping in focus in the dim light. When I pick up the hologram, you can see that there is nothing behind it. The hologram was illuminated with just one color instead of white light. And this illumination is called the reference beam. Let me explain a few things about white light as compared to light from a laser which uh, has exactly one color called monochromatic light. In the 1960s, I had the wonderful experience to take an optics course at the University of Michigan, taught by the guys who created the first holograms, Emmett Leith and Yuri Suputniks, a Latvian like me. This all became possible when lasers were invented around that time. I need to explain that light is made of electromagnetic waves and also explain what colors are. There's a nice analogy between light waves, water waves, and sound waves. Waves are based on going around a circle. That is why waves are sometimes called cycles. In fact, the water molecules in water go in a circle as waves go by. The height of a wave matches how high the dot is while going around a circle. If we plot the height of the dot, it makes the familiar sine wave shape you have probably seen when you studied trigonometry. One of the ways to specify what part of the wave you are talking about is to use its phase angle. This is the angle showing how far the dot has gone around the circle. So a wave starts at zero degrees and goes up to 360 degrees and then starts all over at zero degrees. Another measure of waves is its wavelength. It is the distance between the wave peaks. It is also the distance between the points in consecutive waves, which are at the same phase angle. The waves in this video are moving quite slowly. Sound waves, however, travel at about 767 miles per hour. While light waves travel almost a million times faster 
at about 670 million miles per hour. If we know the wavelength, then we can compute how many waves go by per unit of time by dividing the speed by the wavelength. This is called frequency. How many waves go by per unit of time? It is measured in a unit called Hertz, which is how many waves per second go by, or how many cycles per second, as was said before the unit Hertz was created. As waves go by on the surface of water, the height of the water goes up and down in a nice wave pattern, like the math sine function. As sound waves go through the air, the air pressure goes up and down in a wave pattern. A light wave is a waving electromagnetic field that gets stronger and weaker at a particular rate. We don't really need to get into the further details about electric fields for us to understand holograms. Each color of light has a different wavelength. The waves of all colors go by incredibly fast at the same speed of light. But here, I show them moving slowly so you can see what happens better. The blue light waves have a shorter wavelength, while the red white light waves have a longer wavelength. Blue light thus has a higher frequency than red light because more of its waves go by per second. The wavelength of visible light is around a half of a millionth of a meter. That is about a hundred times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. The frequency of visible light is around 500 million million waves going by per second. That would be 500 terahertz. By comparison, the highest frequency sound waves that people can hear go by at only 20,000 waves per second, 20 kilohertz. The wavelength of audible sound is as small as about a half an inch. When you combine waves of different frequencies, you simply add their peaks and subtract their valleys to get the resulting wave. When you add up the waves from many colors, you get a random looking a wave pattern that is uh, viewed as white light. Even a colored incandescent light bulb, such as a Christmas tree light, is actually putting out many colors of slightly different uh, wavelengths. Even these waves add up to looking like a random pattern. Lasers are special and they emit exactly only one frequency of light, one color of the rainbow. Light of exactly one color is called monochromatic light. The analogy of laser light to sound would be like hearing a tuning fork. Hope you can hear this. It's a very nice, clean sound, exactly one frequency. The light from lasers is also coherent, which means that all of the waves from every light emitting part of the laser are in lockstep with each other. And the other way to say this is to uh, say that all the photons that make up the light beam have matching phase angles at any point in the beam. They are all said to be in phase. Coherent monochromatic light lets us do interesting things like make holograms. White light, or even light from a conventional colored lamp, is analogous to a hissing sound. Next, let's look at the process of interference. This video illustrates interference. As the two source beams are repositioned relative to each other, their sum makes a wave that can be twice as bright when they are in phase, or dark when they are out of phase. This sort of thing happens with water waves too, and sound waves. If you drop just one pebble in a still pool of water, you get nice, clean-looking waves that go in all directions with one wavelength or one frequency. If you splash several stones into a pool of water, the waves add up in a much more complicated pattern. Looking at the surface of the ocean, you can see all kinds of waves interfering. Big ones, little ones, making a complicated surface. When the peaks of waves match and thus make a brighter spot, this is called constructive interference. And when the peaks match valleys, this is called destructive interference. 
This is also why laser light can be dangerously bright when all the photons are in phase. They all help to make the light brighter. With a laser light, you don't get a lot of random destructive interference like you would from a normal light source. This is why a few thousandths of a watt laser beam can be dangerous to shine in your eye compared to looking at, say, a 100 watt light bulb. Another way to visualize waves is to use shading instead of sine wave plots. In the shading version of waves, the peaks are bright and the valleys are dark. And where there are no waves, the shading stays gray. If you have ever looked at laser light from, say, a laser pointer, it has that speckly look. This is caused by interference. When the light paths reach your eye from slightly different places, the peaks and valleys of the various uh, waves might not exactly match because the distance to your eyes um, are slightly different. Where valleys and peaks come together, they cancel each other out, causing dark spots due to the destructive interference. Meanwhile, at other points where peaks match with peaks and valleys match with valleys, the light waves uh, make bright spots due to the constructive interference. Because the distance between the wave peaks and valleys is so incredibly small, a hundredth of a width of a human hair, it does not take much to create this speckled effect. By the way, these speckle patterns can be used to tell if your eyes are in focus or not. When the camera or your eyes are in focus, moving left to right does not move the speckle pattern. If you get out of focus, one way and move left to right, the speckle pattern moves. If you get out of focus the other way, the speckle pattern moves in the opposite direction. The reason for this is more complicated to explain, and we don't need to know that to understand holograms. The next thing we need to know about is diffraction. Light waves and even water waves and sound waves go in a straight line, but when they encounter a physical boundary, they get bent around the corner somewhat this is partly why you can hear someone who is hiding behind a tree, even if you can't see them. So here is a simulation of a wave just going forward without obstruction. Now, if we put in a barrier with a tiny hole, the wave spreads out in different directions after going through the hole. Note that the wave is strongest in the forward direction and is less strong at higher angles away from the hole in the forward direction. Now let's show what happens if we make the barrier have two holes. You get two diffracted waves coming out. But when the two waves encounter each other, sometimes they constructively interfere, while in other areas they destructively interfere. So now we see the combined effects of diffraction and interference. Now let's see what happens when we make more and more holes. At first, you get those bright and dark areas on the right. But as more holes are added, look what happens. The original wave reappears. Let me just say something about how this was computed to make this video. For each point on the right, I add the contribution of the waves from each hole in the barrier. I actually have to add or subtract depending on whether the peaks match peaks or not. This adds up to a lot of computation to make each frame of this video because you have to do this computation for every point at the right and you have to consider every hole contributing light. Nature does this instantly all in parallel, very fast. Another interesting point is that you can actually think of empty space as diffracting the waves at every point. Because there are so many point sources being added up, like having holes everywhere in, in the prior example, the waves end up looking like just the original wave without being diffracted at all, just like the many hole version I showed earlier. The videos are not perfect in brightness at each spot because I use some simplifications in the computation to make the processing take less time, but it does illustrate the effect. Another video shows what it looks like if you have one hole and just make it bigger and bigger. As the hole gets much bigger than the wavelength, the waves look 
less disturbed, as you might expect. I must also point out that the many holes example I showed before works even if the holes are randomly spaced. Here's the simulation for many holes somewhat randomly spaced. At the right, the waves look like they have just continued from the left. This is important to remember for later. Now back to explaining how holograms work. To make a hologram, you have a setup like this. We have a laser light source that illuminates both the film plate as well as the object or objects being photographed. Unlike with regular cameras, no lenses need to be used. The waves coming from all the points on the objects interfere with each other and with the reference beam at the film plate. This interference has to happen or you won't get a hologram. The interference pattern is recorded on the film plate. Where most of the waves constructively interfered, the film will have a clear spot there. Where they destructively interfered, the film will have a dark spot. Here's the microscope view of those spots in the film. I'm not going to go into uh, the details of why, but the film can be a negative or positive equally well, or even just record a phase change for those more technically inclined who know what that means. To really understand how the hologram works, it is best to use the most simple example possible. I will just use two sources of light. One source is the plane waves from the upper left, illuminating the photographic plate. Plane waves look like almost parallel lines, as if they came from a point source very, very far away. I will designate these plane waves as the reference beam. The other light source is an object that is just a single point of light in the lower left. When you put these light sources together, you can see how the waves interfere with each other in this video. There are places where they destructively interfere with each other and others where they constructively interfere. The light intensity is strong at points where you see the waves wave a lot, change between dark and light. At other points where they stay constantly gray, the light intensity is weak or dark. This is a picture of the wave intensity, which is what matters when exposing the photographic film. The intensity pattern does not change with time unless you move the light sources. When I sample a frame from the video showing the waves in the intensity version, you can see that the gray areas in the video represent weak intensity while places with constructive interference, those with strong and black and white waves going by, have high intensity. Now along this center line, I will record the light intensity on a virtual film. Where the intensity is high, white, the film will become clear, while the low intensity places, black, will leave the film opaque, not letting light through. Now, the really cool thing about holograms is that any portion of the original wavefront that was used to expose the film can reproduce the entire picture. So if I shine just the plane wave reference beam onto the film, the diffraction caused by the film will reproduce the other point source of light as well at the right. You can see the curves from that. Or I can illuminate the film with just the point source and then the plane wave gets reproduced at the right. You can see the lines from that. The hologram film lets light through preferentially in those places where both light sources constructively interfered. Those clear places on the film are the places where most of the light waves from the scene constructively interfered which means that they had the same phase relative to the phases at all the other clear spots on the film. So no matter which light source you shine onto the holographic film, the same light pattern comes out on the right from all those holes in the film. 
This is the crux of why a hologram works. Remember before where I showed more and more holes, the waves were reproduced on the right? On the hologram, the holes, the clear spots, are not randomly placed, but rather placed exactly where either light source shines the same phase of light onto each hole compared to all the other holes. Same phase. That is, the difference in phase angles of the light in all the holes is the same as it was when the original wave front exposed the film. Thus, for each light source, the holes are in the right places to reproduce both waves on the right. If those clear spots are only at random places, just the source wave front appears on the right, and you don't see the image from the hologram. In a hologram, those clear spots are so tiny that you have an incredibly large number of them, which helps make a nice reproduction of the original scene. This process works for not just two light sources, but for many light sources. The reference beam from the laser and from all the tiny points of light coming from the objects being photographed. The more parts of the original wavefront you shine on the hologram, the brighter the whole scene becomes. A hologram reproduces the original image when illuminated by only a portion of the original wavefront. This is called an associative memory. Any part of the original scene can retrieve the whole scene. Obviously, the more of the original scene you have, the better you can see the whole because it would be brighter. So with holograms, the normal way to reproduce the image is to use that plane wave reference beam of light because it's usually the brightest part of the original wavefront and its positioning is less critical. This is usually more than half the light hitting the film when it was exposed and is a good way to get a strong image retrieved. You could use a subset of the original objects to reproduce the whole, but this is difficult for two reasons. First, the original objects give off smaller percentage of light in the original wavefront. <clears throat> but more importantly, you could have you would have to accurately place those original objects and the laser light shining on them accurately to within about a quarter of a wavelength. And this is incredibly small distance. Even a slight vibration from sound or just jiggling the table, uh, holding everything in place could potentially knock things uh, out of whack enough to make it not work. This is pretty much impossible if you've moved the objects, the film or the laser light source, even the tiniest bit. However, people have rigged up experiments demonstrating this by developing the film in place with having, without having to move the film the laser or the objects. Now they need a rather strong laser illumination uh, on the original objects and a physically very stable platform to get this to work well. The diffraction from the spots on the film is weak at higher angles from the reproducing beams of light. So hologram images are usually much dimmer than the reference beam illuminating them. I'll show you more holograms I made in a bit. I want to mention that you can actually record many, hol many holograms on the same photographic plate using multiple exposures, as long as you use different reference beams for each one. For example, having the reference beams coming from entirely different angles. Holograms can be made to work with white light reference beams too. They may make uh, the image somewhat fuzzy due to the many colors present in white light, but this can be overcome when the film emulsion has more thickness. Layers of dark and light within the film end up causing interference to preferentially allow only one color of light coming from the white light to get through the film, but more than the other colors, thus making the hologram clearer. Earlier, I mentioned that holograms may be the mechanism that the brain uses for memory. Instead of light paths, Think of using axons and dendrites from nerve cells. Nerve cells can act like the photographic film. They don't have to be in a plane like the film was in the hologram. Actually, the hologram does not need to be flat either. 
The nerve cells receive signals from their shorter dendrites, and they send signals using their longer exons. Each can connect to many cells. Instead of light waves, the nerves send out a series of pulses at a certain rate, as if they were waves. When a nerve cell receives pulses from different exons at the same time, the pulses sort of constructively interfere, causing a chemical change in that nerve cell. This change makes the cells act like a transparent part of the holographic film, and thus the cell tends to send out its own pulse when it sees several light pulses coming in at the same time. Meanwhile, neurons that don't receive pulses from multiple sources at the same time have a chemical change, which makes them send, you know, not to send or respond, sending out pulses of their own. So these chemical changes are like the process of it developing the film plate. So the nerve cells become part of the holographic film and the axons are the light paths. This could be the basis for remembering things by being reminded of a part of the original memory. In other words, part of the original scene. As I pointed out, you can record many scenes on the same hologram. Likewise, you can uh, record many memories in the same set of nerve cells. A part of the original memory is good at recovering the whole memory, even though many memories may be stored in the same place. Similar things can work in certain artificial intelligence neural networks that you may have read about. So now I'm going to show a few holograms. This is a hologram that was done with a green laser instead of a red one. As you can see, when I move the camera back and forth, the relative position of the lens and the dice change. You can see the effect of the lens even magnifying the dice in the back. Actually, it's making it smaller because it's a concave lens. There's some dirt and dust on the hologram, which is causing interesting reflections and things. And here I'm going to, in the dim light, look behind the hologram, show you that there's nothing there. Here's a larger hologram with a Coke can in the back, a bunch of Scrabble tiles and a lens. Um, and I'm going to take these pieces away. Okay, I'm going to take the can away. You can see the image is still being reproduced. These things were in this place when the hologram was made. So I'm going to take the M away. And there it is, still being reproduced by the hologram itself. I'm going to take some more stuff away, some of the other letters. And you can see when I put my hand in front of the laser, it, it casts a shadow on the hologram itself so it doesn't reproduce the um, image at that point. And here you can see the effect of the lens again. Oh, this time it's a magnifying glass. It's making that tile bigger. And you can see as I move the camera back and forth, the perspective changes. So it's really a true 3D view. And you have to also uh, focus for distance. The camera has a little bit of a hard time in the dim light. And as before, behind there, there's nothing there. Lita Hollow is the company that makes this special kind of film that develops in place. And you can see some other interference effects due to the reflections of laser light from various things in the scene there, and the plastic and so forth. This is what that hologram looks like in normal light. So you put it in the position there, and you don't see anything until you turn on the laser, and then the image appears. In daylight, you can see that the image is much dimmer than uh, normal light because of it's just based on the diffraction and not anything else. Anyway, it's kind of a nice hologram. Here's, uh, here are the tiles, the things I use to make it. And as you see, when I don't illuminate the parts of the hologram where they can't um, diffract, you won't see an image there. I 
have fat fingers there. Here we have another hologram I made, a big lizard and a bunch of uh, tiles. And you can see from the vibration on the table right here where the interference is causing things to not work or work. Here I'm going to take out the tiles. And this hologram came out a lot dimmer, so the things I'm removing don't show up as bright. There's a pair of reading glasses there also. The A looked a little bit better. It must have had more light in just the right amount. And so did the R. Taking more of the pieces off. Getting rid of the lizard. Some other stuff. See, now you can see that those objects are gone. There's less interference effects from vibration of the table. It's not shaking around like it was before. This is a dimmer hologram. And it probably didn't have as good a lighting on some of those objects there. And as before, if you look over on top of it, there's nothing there anymore. And if I move the, pick up the whole hologram, move it out, you can see it goes with it. And there's a certain angle where those plane waves hit that makes it the brightest. I have fed you a fire hose of information. If you get lost, I would suggest you listen again and pause at places to think about what I said. On a computer, you can see the transcript below the video along with a glossary of terms I used. Anyway, I had fun making the holograms and the animations for this video. And more importantly, I hope you learned something about holograms. Thanks for watching.